Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you all so much. Well, good afternoon, APHA. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. It's a real privilege to be here. Let me stop for a minute and acknowledge Mayor Nutter. I know uh, he was here earlier. It's great to be in his city. I am a New Orleans Saints fan. Sorry, <laughs> sorry to each and every one of you. Uh, and to be introduced by Dr. Georges Benjamin is quite an honor as well. And to have an opportunity to congratulate in person our wonderful new Surgeon General, Dr. Regina Benjamin, made it uh, worth the trip. And I haven't even started my speech yet. And finally, I want to acknowledge Dr. Cheryl Easley, your president, for her impassioned and inspired leadership. It is an amazing opportunity for us to meet here today, and particularly after the historic vote last night in the United States House of Representatives. You all win the Great Timing Award, and Americans are winners because right now we are one step closer to the President's commitment to quality and affordable health care. After a century of work on this very issue, we've closer than we, we're closer than we've ever been to Americans having stability and security in their coverage, expanding that coverage to millions more people, and the ultimate goal of this effort, building a healthier America with prevention and with wellness. We're closer than we've ever been to meeting APHA's goal of being the healthiest nation in one generation. So now it's time to redouble our efforts and get across the finish line. And I thank you in advance for all the hard work and for all the advocacy you've done uh, and will do. Now a major part of our work at EPA in the last year has focused on broadening the conversation on environmentalism. In part, that means reaching out to those groups that historically are underrepresented in the environmental movement minorities and low-income communities who see the environment and environmentalists as a luxury that they simply literally can't afford. I'm here to change that message, hopefully uh, literally and figuratively. But it's also a challenge that the public health community shares with the environmental community. After all, we both seek, out to, re seek to reach out to people who are deeply affected by the issues that we work on people who are in great need of the work that we all do, but who have little voice in the conversations about how we do our work. But another part of what I mean when I talk about expanding environmentalism is changing the way we think about environmental issues. And that's what I'd like to challenge us on this morning. It means changing our conversation to show how things like climate change and water safety and water cleanliness are real in people's everyday lives. That's what I want to talk about. When we talk about environmentalism, let's face it, it brings to mind sweeping vistas and beautiful uh, wide open landscapes. Most people think of saving the whales or the spotted owl or preserving our old growth forests because those are the roots of the environmental movement in our country. And those things are critically important, but they're only part of the story. When the environmental movement really got its shape back in the 1960s, moving into the 70s, it started in our nation's cities, our developed areas, not our parks. It started with people concerned about breathing air pollution, about people who literally were concerned about water quality as they watched rivers that were on fire, and people who were increasingly concerned about the products of our industrial re revolution and what it meant in terms of the chemicals in the food that they were giving their families. In short, environmentalism started because of concerns about public health. Environmental protection is about human protection. It's about family protection. It's about community protection. It's about safeguarding people in the places where they work, where they live, where they play, where they learn. So environmental protection is public health protection. Now, you may not think of yourself as an environmentalist. You may think that uh, that's somebody who drives a hybrid car or has a compost pile in the backyard. You may not be up at night worrying about climate change. But if you've ever treated a patient with asthma and warned them about ozone alert days and the high ozone levels and what that means for their health, that is environmental protection. 
If you've ever counseled a pregnant mother that certain chemicals in the environment, in the food, in the water, are linked to developmental disabilities that will affect her child before he or she is even born, that, my friends, is environmental protection. If you've ever written a paper about lead in water or talked about how climate change affects the movement of disease or researched the connections between bioaccumulative chemicals and cancers, that's environmental protection too. So as far as I'm concerned, you are some of the most active environmentalists out there, and I thank you. The reason I thank you is because I believe passionately, passionately that that is absolutely where we need to be. We need you because of heart disease, cancer, and respiratory illness. Three of the top four most fatal health threats in America, they account for more than half of the deaths in the nation, and all three have been linked to environmental causes. We need you because asthma now affects nearly 23 million people in these United States. Both children and adults with asthma make nearly 17 million visits to doctor's offices and to hospitals every year. About 2 million people go to the emergency room every year, and more than 400,000 are hospitalized with extreme asthma cases. The average inpatient stay is three days. Across the United States today, almost one in every 10 kids has asthma, making this a crucial children's health issue as well. One of those kids is my 12-year-old, oops, 13-year-old son, Brian. <laughs> Thank goodness he's not here. He is a teenager now. <laughs> Brian has fought with asthma his entire life. His very first Christmas, we spent in the hospital with him unable to breathe. All his life, we've known the constant ritual of being worried when we travel, when he goes outside, when he's exposed to a new environment, about what environmental triggers might put us in our asthma cycle again. Even today, at age 13, with a managed case, with a well-managed case, and with a well-educated child, I still wake up in the middle of the night if I hear him stirring, listening for that croupy cough that told me that we were beginning the cycle again. And we don't get it very often, thank God. It brings me to the next reason why we need you, and that's children's health. You might have heard in the introduction that children's health is one of our top priorities, again, at EPA. And I need you desperately on the front lines. Our wonderful First Lady, Michelle Obama, came to EPA earlier this year. And even before the garden was completely planted, she made it clear that her role as First Lady would be about the health and safety of our children being a top priority for this country. It's why, my friends, we've been so active in environmental issues in our schools. Earlier this year, EPA initiated a program to begin to monitor the air quality around select schools in the United States. I wish we could do them all. But we did it in response to a USA Today article, a series of articles that came out, front page articles, and said, listen, there's high levels of contaminants in uh, the air around schools in our country. Parents all over the, co the country read this story. They read about these high levels of contamination. They read about how children absorb chemicals at the same rate as adults, but that means higher body burdens because children weigh uh, so much less. They read about how children can be more vulnerable to those chemicals and to uh, reactions from asthma all the way to leukemia as a result. And then they sent their kids to school on the school bus and wondered whether or not they were doing the right thing and what that meant. It's part of our job at EPA to ask the hard questions, knowing in advance that even as we take those samples, we won't be able to give conclusive answers, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't ask the questions. doesn't mean we shouldn't start to get the data that we then, quite frankly, turn over to public health professionals like many of you to help us interpret for, for worried parents, for worried school administrators. So we need you by our side. We also need you by our side because environmental health issues never travel alone. Those areas where concentration of asthma is highest are the same areas where other respiratory diseases and cancers and other illness are often found. 